Well, good morning, Grace Chapel. Good to be with you. I hope you all had a good Thanksgiving weekend. I also hope you got more sleep than I did. We had our whole gang home, so uh, four kids, three in-laws, four grandchildren, sleeping all over the place. Somehow, Karen and I ended up with the blow-up mattress in the third floor attic dormer, bouncing around up there, and babies were up all night, and toddlers wandering the house, and it was like the bad old days all over again. <laughs> At one point, I was getting up pretty early to try to get a little bit of work done while there was some quiet, and I passed by my bedroom and saw my youngest single son, 20 years old, 22 years old, sleeping diagonally across our queen bed. <laughs> and I thought, wait, what is wrong with this picture here? So, it was a good week. We're shipping them all off this weekend, and I'll catch up. I'll catch up tonight. But Well, in his recent book, uh, Miracles, Eric Metaxas tells the story of a man named Simon who lives in the, in the nation of Ghana on the African continent. Now, Simon is a driver for a relief and development agency there in the nation of Ghana. So his job is to ferry leaders and dignitaries from one place to another and occasionally drive the trucks and heavy equipment they need for their work. Now Simon, for many years, has suffered with diabetes, but in recent years, uh, he developed an infection in his foot that just would not get better. And at a certain point, the foot had deteriorated so badly, it looked as though it would need to be amputated. That would mean the end of his livelihood as a driver. Well, desperate for a remedy, Simon went off to a, another hospital in a nearby city to get their opinion, and they confirmed that, yes, indeed, his foot would need to be amputated, and soon. Well, dejected, Simon went home that day and told his wife the sad news. The next morning, he went to the morning prayer meeting in the village, as he typically did uh, with the staff, and they actually prayed for him there and for his foot to be healed, but nothing happened. Later that day, he stopped at a gas station to refuel his truck. And as he was putting gas in the tank, he noticed a beggar approaching him. Now, that was a common occurrence in the village, but he didn't really recognize this particular man. Uh, instinctively, he reached into his pocket for some loose change to give to the man, but the man indicated he, he wasn't interested in money. He said that he had noticed Simon limping and wondered if he could pray for him. Well, this all seemed rather strange, but Simon agreed, and so the, the, the homeless man or beggar took, took a vial of oil out of his cloak and anointed his foot and leg and prayed over it. Now, again, nothing happened, but as Simon finished fueling his tank and turned to thank the man, he realized that he was gone. He couldn't find him anywhere or anyone who had seen the man. Well, later that day, when Simon was at home, he suddenly felt a strange warmth in his foot. He took off his shoe and sock and watched in amazement over the next hour or two as color returned to his foot and the pain diminished. And by the time evening had come, he was walking around the house unencumbered and without pain. A couple of days later, he went back to the hospital to uh, show the doctors and they explained they, what, what happened to him was impossible. They had no explanation. In fact, the word they used was miracle. Well, that was a couple of years ago. Uh, Simon is still driving. His foot is still healthy. And he still believes that there was an angel who appeared to him that day and that what happened to his foot was nothing less than a miracle. Now, what do you think? Is such a thing really possible? I mean, do miracles really happen today? Do you believe there's a God who sometimes enters into our experience and does remarkable and even impossible things. If you believe that, then you have no problem with the story of a, a man's foot being healed. If you struggle with that, then you not only have a problem with Simon's story, you have a problem with the Christmas story. Because the Christmas story is a miracle story from beginning to end. This Advent season, we're going to be exploring the miracle side of Christmas. And if ever there's a season of the year in which people ought to be open to the possibility of the miraculous, it's Christmas time. I mean, how many of our favorite Christmas stories and traditions involve miraculous happenings? A jolly old man and his flying reindeer who deliver toys to every good boy and girl across the world on one night. An angel who saves good old George Bailey from financial ruin and leaping off a bridge. A department store Santa who somehow works wonders in the lives of people around him. 
And when Dwight Schrute of the office <laughs> runs over a goose on his way to work during the holiday season, he declares it to be a Christmas miracle. I mean, that line, it's a Christmas miracle, has become cliche for us. All of which suggests that we want to believe in the miraculous. That we long for the possibility that remarkable things can happen in this world, in our lives, even today. That's part of the wonder of the Christmas season. But do we dare believe that? I mean, can a reasonable, intelligent, educated, enlightened, 21st, person, 21st century person really believe in miracles? And if we can, what does that mean for us, for our lives and for our Christmas season? Those are the questions we're going to go after in this series that we're calling Live the Impossible. It's going to take us right on through the four Sundays of Advent, Christmas Eve, and then the Sunday after Christmas. And if you have friends or relatives you've been thinking about inviting to church with you, this could be a great season and a great topic to invite them these next coming, coming weeks. We're going to launch the series this morning uh, with what could easily be called the mother of all miracles, the virgin birth of Christ. From very earliest days, Christians had believed that Jesus was born of a woman who'd had no conjugal relations with a man. And it's so central to our faith that when the early church fathers began to formulate creeds that would articulate the essentials, the non-negotiables of our faith, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, they included the line about a virgin birth right up there with the Trinity and the resurrection of Christ and the forgiveness of sins. And so they must have considered this a foundational truth for our faith. And yet, from earliest days, the virgin birth has been disputed, not only by skeptics outside the faith, but even by people inside the faith. Some Christians have suggested that the Bible doesn't really teach the virgin birth. Others have said that even if it does, it's not something we have to believe in order to be Christian people. Harry Emerson Fosdick was famous for being the voice of liberal Protestantism in the 20th century. And he famously said on one occasion that he didn't believe in the virgin birth and hoped no other Christian did either. In more recent days, the Jesus Seminar, a collection of uh, scholars, New Testament scholars, rejected the notion of a virgin birth by a vote of 24 to 1. For many people, the idea of a virgin birth is just one more reason for dismissing the Christian faith as irrational or untenable. And yet, the vast majority of Christian people still believe in a virgin birth. And it is one of the most cherished aspects of our Christmas story. So let's begin by looking at the biblical evidence for a virgin birth. Does the Bible really teach it? And if it does, can we believe it and does it really matter? That's where we're headed. Now, for several weeks this fall, we have been rediscovering Jesus by finding traces of Jesus in the pages of the Old Testament. We're going to do that one more time today as we kind of turn the corner into the Advent season. Because it turns out that the idea of a virgin birth originates in the Old Testament, 700 years before Christ is born in the prophet Isaiah. In chapter 7, verse 14, we read some familiar words. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Now, those words were originally spoken by Isaiah the prophet to Ahaz, the king of Judah, warning him not to form political alliances to try to protect the nation, but instead to trust God alone. Isaiah wanted Ahaz and the people of Israel to trust God and, and nothing else. He even invited Ahaz to ask God for a sign guaranteeing God's presence and protection. Ahaz refused to ask for a sign. He was so determined to, he would rather trust his own political machinations, his own military alliances. He refused to ask for a sign. 
As one commentator put it, practical people have to live in the real world. And that's the approach that Ahaz took. As a result, he is rebuked. And Isaiah announces that the Lord's going to give him a sign anyway, like it or not. And this sign is going to be so remarkable, there will be no question about the power and presence of God. Now, this prophecy is one of those instances of double fulfillment that we find sometimes in the Scripture. In other words, it had meaning and fulfillment for Ahaz back in um, the 7th, 6th century B.C., which we don't have time to get into. But it also looked forward to a fulfillment years, centuries down the road when God's Messiah would come into the world. And it looked for that Messiah to come in a remarkable way. It promised that the child, this Messiah, would be born of a virgin. Now, critics quickly point out that the, the Hebrew word that's used here doesn't actually have to mean virgin. It could just be describing a young woman of marriageable age. We might use the word maiden that it's describing. And that's true. Technically, the word does not require that the woman has not had any intimate relationships. However, Whenever this particular word is used in other places in the Old Testament, it always refers to that kind of a woman, a young woman who has remained chaste. And some years later, when Jewish scholars took the Hebrew scriptures and translated them into the Greek language, they chose the word that technically and literally means virgin. Now remember, these were Jewish scholars. So they're not trying to prove or disprove anything. They're just looking for the word that gets at Isaiah's meaning. And as they understood it, Isaiah was talking about a virgin. But even if we accept the fact that, that Isaiah is only talking about a young woman of marriageable age, it's still not a problem. It simply means that Isaiah has given us a more general description, and then the New Testament gives us a more specific description of Jesus. Matthew and Luke don't contradict Isaiah's prophecy. They just clarify it by calling out how remarkable that birth is. However you want to understand it, this is a remarkable prophecy that someday down the road, a remarkable thing is going to happen. A child is going to be coming into the world in a most remarkable way. Well, fast forward now to the New Testament. In the New Testament, we find two separate accounts of Jesus' birth, Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel. Now, they both tell the same story, but from a different perspective. Matthew tells the story from Joseph's perspective, and Luke tells the story from Mary's perspective. And even the most liberal critics will agree that Matthew and Luke didn't collaborate as they put their Gospels together. They were operating with different strands of tradition. And yet on this crucial and very specific point, they are in perfect agreement with each other. Luke tells it this way. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. The virgin's name was Mary. Twice, Luke uses the word virgin, and it is the word that technically means having had no sexual relationships. Matthew tells it just a little bit differently. He says, his mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. So here we have two separate accounts from two different traditions using different words and yet both describing a miraculous, unprecedented event. A child being born into the world without an earthly father. Not only that, their accounts appear to be very honest, authentic kind of reports. Joseph and Mary are stunned and troubled by what they've just been told as we would expect them to. They knew where babies come from. They, they knew this kind of thing was not possible. They knew how scandalous it was. I mean, suppose the Bible reported that after receiving the news from the angel that she was going to give birth to a child, even though she wasn't Mary, married, Mary had said, hey, that's neat, Gabriel. Will he look like me? It's not the kind of response you'd expect. Or suppose after Mary tells Joseph that even though they're not married, she's expecting a child, he says, hey, that's great, and starts handing out cigars. If there was that kind of response, we would say that's not normal, that's not natural, that's not believable. But instead, we find Joseph and Mary reacting 
just like any normal, thoughtful, intelligent person would react. Mary says, how can this be? And Joseph, he starts looking for a lawyer. (laughs) Because they both understood a virgin birth was impossible. They reacted accordingly. And so we have these two independent accounts that validate each other and both read in authentic and believable ways. Now, how about the other two Gospels, uh, John and Mark? They don't tell us anything about the birth of Jesus, so they don't mention the virgin birth. But they do both tell us that throughout Jesus' life and ministry, there were suspicions and rumors about the circumstances of his birth and his legitimacy. When we get to the rest of the New Testament, even though the virgin birth is not specifically mentioned, we interestingly find many references to Jesus' mother, but no reference to an earthly father. So some critics have suggested that the early church made up the idea of a virgin birth in order to kind of bolster the uniqueness of Jesus' identity and his deity. Well, that makes us ask, why? Why would you want to make that up? If you're trying to win credibility for a new religion, why would you lead with something as preposterous and as scandalous as a virgin birth? As the saying goes, it's a non-starter. Remember, the Old Testament, as we just read, didn't require a virgin birth. And so it wasn't as though they had to concoct some story to fulfill a prophecy. They simply reported what happened, what they'd been told, and it reads very believably. So when we get to the Scripture, we find this honest, unpretentious account. It's foreshadowed in the Old Testament. It is articulated twice in the New Testament Gospels and supported by the rest of the New Testament. And so from very early days, the church has affirmed its faith in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. But now we have to ask why. Why is this so important? It seems like such a minor detail. Why is it so important that we believe in a virgin birth, and does it really make any practical difference in our lives? Well, to begin with, there are a few theological reasons the virgin birth is important. I'll just touch on those quickly because I want to get to the practical aspect. But first, the reliability of the Bible is at stake. If the Bible teaches that Jesus was born of a virgin, as we have just seen it does, and we question that, Well, now we're questioning the inspiration and the authority and the reliability of the Bible. So the reliability of the Scripture is at stake. Secondly, the virgin birth helps to explain how Jesus could have a dual nature, fully God and fully man. His human nature comes to him through Mary, his earthly mother, just as every other child that comes into the world. His divine nature comes through his heavenly Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so you have fully God and fully human. He was the offspring of, a, of a, uh, an earthly mother and a heavenly father. Now, some people will also contend that the virgin birth is important because it explains how Jesus could be without sin and been born without a sin nature. And that's why he didn't have an earthly father. The Bible doesn't really make that point in particular, and I'm not really sure why it's necessary, frankly. If If God could overshadow the sinful nature of a mother, he certainly could have overshadowed the sinful nature of an earthly father as well. There's no evidence in the Bible that Mary was without sin. There's no evidence in the Bible that she was immaculately conceived herself. Those traditions came much later in the life of the church. However you want to understand it, the virgin birth matters theologically because it affirms the reliability of the Bible and helps us understand how Jesus could be fully God and fully man. But there's also a very practical and personal dimension to our belief in the virgin birth. If it's true that a woman could bear a child without ever having had relations with a man, then anything is possible. 
If the virgin birth is possible, then almost anything is possible. It means a miracle happened. And if a miracle happened once, a miracle can happen again. So this is probably a good time to back up a little bit and talk for a moment about miracles. The dictionary defines miracle as a wondrous event that appears inexplicable by the laws of nature and so is held to be supernatural in origin or an act of God. That's important to notice here. This is a secular source, and yet it's indicating that a miracle is more than just a surprising or an unlikely event. A team coming from behind in the final two minutes of the game doesn't really qualify. It's an impossible happening. It's something that requires a supernatural explanation. Like somebody beating the Patriots, uh, for instance. <laughs> and this idea of the supernatural of another realm, that's an idea that Eric Metaxas unpacks for us in his book. Now, just a word for those who maybe aren't familiar with him. Eric Metaxas is a best-selling author, a well-known columnist, writes for the New York Times and a variety of other publications. He is somewhat famous in the church world because he helped to create veggie tales, okay? But he is no slouch. He is a Yale grad himself, and he just looks smart, doesn't he? <laughs> so he's a thoughtful, intelligent, reasonable, credible voice. He's also a committed Christian. But in his book on miracles, he tries to take a step back and take a theological, philosophical, scientific, and personal look at the subject of miracles. And it really is a good read. So as you're making up lists for people, if you've got some seeker or even skeptic or believer on your list, this could be a really good read for them. Order tomorrow at a discount, but not at work, okay? Now, Metaxas argues that a miracle happens when something outside the space-time universe enters or invades the space-time universe. In other words, the very notion of a miracle implies that there's another realm outside the realm that we all know and live in, the realm that we can verify by science, by empirical data. data. There's another realm out there, a supernatural realm that cannot be seen and heard and felt in any of the normal ways. And every once in a while, it seems, these two realms collide. They intersect. And when they do, remarkable things happen. Things that can't be explained by time and space, by scientific explanations. They are beyond human explanation. And if this realm exists, if there is a force or a being out there greater than our own realm, then it's only logical to imagine that from time to time that force, that being, would intersect with ours, would in fact intervene in ours, would in fact perhaps want to make itself or himself known in our experience. And if that other realm broke into ours, wouldn't it by definition be wondrous and inexplicable and miraculous? Peggy Noonan is a former speechwriter for President Reagan and a columnist for the Wall Street Journal. She writes, Miracles exist in part, in part as gifts, and in part as clues that there is something beyond the flat world that we see. The very notion of the wondrous, of the miraculous, suggests that there may be more to reality than we can see. Now, if all that went by too quickly, pick up the book for yourself and give it a read or come back next week and we'll talk some more about it. But let's go back one more time to Isaiah's prophecy and pick up one little word that we skipped over. It's a very important word. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. In the Bible... Miracles are always meant to be signs. In fact, that's the word the New Testament usually uses to describe miracles. It talks about signs and wonders. John's Gospel tells us about seven signs Jesus performed. Those signs are meant to 
reveal something, to tell us something, to point us in a direction. There are forms of communication. When you're driving down a highway, the, the sign will tell you what road you're on and where your destination is. And the same is true of miracles. They're a form of communication. They are road signs along the way of life. And they tell us that someone is out there. They tell us that something is happening, that we are not alone on this road of life. And there's something very important for us here, something that dawned on me as I was wrestling with the subject of miracles this time around. I'm going to put it this way. Miracles are not primarily solutions to our problems, but signs that point us toward God. And I'll talk a little bit more about this next week, but, but it helps us understand, perhaps, why miracles don't happen more often than, we, than they do. I mean, why don't they happen all the time? Why isn't every sick person healed? Why isn't every injustice overthrown? Well, because miracles were never meant to be solutions to all of our problems. They were meant to be signs that point us at strategic moments toward God. They are timely reminders that this world is not all there is. There is another realm out there greater than we know. There is someone out there, someone who cares, someone who wants to be known, someone who can and will from time to time intervene in our world to reveal himself and accomplish his purposes. When you're driving down a highway, you don't expect to see a sign every mile. That, that would be superfluous and it would get to be annoying after a while. In the same way, we shouldn't expect to see miracles every single day, outstanding, remarkable things. We don't need that. But once in a while, they sure are wonderful reminders. And so we drive down the road every day with our eyes wide open, ready for God to do something remarkable. And that's why the virgin birth matters. It certainly mattered to Mary and Joseph. They were about to head down a lonely, difficult, unmapped road. And they needed to know that they were on the right path and that God was with them and for them. And I imagine whenever they began to doubt that, not just during those nine months, but in the many, many years that followed, when they began to doubt and wonder if God was for them and with them, they only needed to look up again and remember that sign of a remarkable thing that happened to them, the virgin birth of their child, and a reminder they were on the right road. And that's why the virgin birth and miracles matter to us. They remind us that we are not alone, that God is there, that he's with us and for us, and at times will break into our experience. And that's why I call this the mother of all miracles. Because if a virgin birth is possible, then anything else is possible as well. It's the very outrageousness of it that is the point and why the early church fathers included it in our declarations of faith. Some years ago, the journalist and TV personality Larry King, who loves to interview famous people, he was asked if he could interview anyone from human history, who would he interview? Without pausing for a moment, he said, Jesus Christ. And when the follow-up question was, what would you like to ask him? This is what King replied. I'd like to ask him if he was indeed virgin-born, because the answer to that question would define history for me. You see, if the virgin birth really happened, it's a game changer. It's a sign that God exists, that he cares, that he wants to be made known, and that he will from time to time break into our experience in powerful ways to reveal himself and to accomplish his purpose. If, if a virgin can conceive, then sick bodies can be healed and floundering marriages can be saved, and broken relationships can be restored, and life-controlling addictions can be broken, and racial barriers can come down, and the materially poor can be lifted up, and tyrants 
can be deposed and terrorism can be overcome and justice can be done. If the virgin birth is possible, then all these things become possible as well. Larry King was right. If Christ was born of a virgin, it changes everything. Because if a miracle happened once to a peasant, ordinary couple in first century Judea, a miracle can happen anytime, anywhere, to anyone, including you and me. Amen. <laughs> what it means, what it means is that every day is pregnant with the impossible. Every day is pregnant with the impossible. In the second half of his book, Metaxas offers a collection of miracle stories, some of them grand, some of them very, very minor. But in one of them, he tells the story of a friend of his named Larry Poland. Larry is a high-powered executive in the Hollywood film industry. He's a Christian who tries to influence other producers and directors to address and be sensitive to Christian themes and those sorts of things in their, in their entertainment industry. Well, through a colleague in the industry, he learned of a producer, well-known, who was going through a very difficult time, a time brought on by his own his own doing in part. The, the man, the producer, his name was Mark, was going through a, a, a bitter and costly and public divorce. That was happening because for years he'd been carrying on an affair with another woman who had just left him for another man. So he was facing financial ruin, professional ruin, not to mention remorse and loneliness and his colleagues in the industry were concerned for his well-being. Well, Larry heard about this and tried on a couple of occasions to reach out to him and get together, but to no avail. Well, one day, Larry's assistant came to him toward the end of the day and said that for some reason, all his appointments for tomorrow were canceling. I mean, all of them. Even his breakfast appointment, which had been a long-standing, important breakfast appointment, it was canceled. And she had tried and tried and tried to fill that appointment, and she'd always been able to do that, but she could not fill that appointment. At that point, Larry remembered this producer and said, why don't you see if you can get Mark on the phone? And they did. And they had a very brief conversation. Larry introduced himself. He said, hi, I'm Larry Poland. I'm going to be in town tomorrow morning, and I wondered if you might want to have breakfast. He says there was a long pause and then a half-hearted response. I guess so. Apparently, having breakfast with a stranger was not at the top of this producer's list. So next morning, they met at a Denny's in Hollywood. Yes, there are Denny's in Hollywood. <laughs> I don't think you'll see Brad and Angelie there, but anyway, some people go there. And Mark shared his whole sad story. As they came to the end, after listening carefully, Larry said simply, it sounds like you need God's help to deal with this. To make a long story short, Larry shared with him the simple message of God's love, Christ's life and death and resurrection, the fact that he could be forgiven for all he had done, be healed and restored and put back on a good road again. It was the first time the man had fully heard and understood that message. When Larry said, would you like to receive Christ right now, right here? He said, yes. And there in the booth at Denny's, they prayed and he opened his heart to Christ and received forgiveness and newness. When they said amen, Mark began crying and laughing uncontrollably. So uncontrollably that the other patrons began looking up from their grand slams to wonder what was going on at that table. When he finally settled down a bit, he explained his reaction. He said to Larry, Yesterday when you called, I was lying in bed with a razor in my hand, ready to slash my wrists. I shouted out loud, God, if you're there, help me. At that moment, the phone rang, and it was you asking me to have breakfast. Now, does that qualify as a wondrous event that seems inexplicable by the laws of nature and must therefore be an act of God? Well, you'll have to decide that for yourself, just as you'll have to decide if the virgin birth really happened. But if it did, it changes everything because it means that on any given day, at any given moment, God can break into your experience and do something miraculous. Living the impossible means that on any given day, at any given moment, God can break in to your experience and do something remarkable. It means that everything matters. Every canceled appointment, 
every breakfast at Denny's or wherever you happen to go, every phone call, every time you stop to fill up your gas tank, every homeless person you meet on a street, every day, every moment, every encounter is pregnant with the impossible, that God might choose that moment to break into your experience or someone else's and reveal himself and do something wonderful. Do you see how that changes the way you live? You wake up every morning wondering what God might do today. You walk through the day with your eyes wide open, your ears attentive, your hands and feet ready to speak and act. It makes every day rich with meaning and possibility. And that's what it means for this Christmas season as well. It's pregnant with the possibility that God could do something wonderful in your life, in your family, in the life of some friend or relative or neighbor that you have in our church, in our community, our city, our world. Who knows what might happen? Some people wonder if you can be a Christian without believing in the virgin birth. I'm not prepared to answer that question, but my response is, why would you want to be? Why would you want to worship a God who can't create life in a young woman's womb? Why would you want to practice a faith that's devoid of wonder and possibility and mystery and power? How much better to go through life knowing that on any given day, at any given moment, God can break in and do something miraculous. Let's pray. Lord, we pause on the threshold of this season, grateful for the possibilities of it. We know there will be all kinds of demands on our time and attention and energy strains on our relationships, maybe even tests of our faith as we make our way through this season. But we're grateful for this reminder that you can meet us there in those very moments, perhaps in the most challenging ones. And so we invite you today to be at work in our lives, our homes, our church, our communities. Pray, Lord, that you might open our eyes, our ears, and our very hearts to believe that you care, that you're there, and that you might do something wonderful. We don't just wait for it, we ask for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's finish by expressing this spirit of expectancy as we head into the Advent season. Let's stand as we sing. One.